गुड मॉर्निंग मिस्टर बाला गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग कौशिक सर गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू आई थिंक इट इज टाइम फॉर अस टू स्टार्ट द सेशन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट मी वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिकॉज ऑफ मेहता मेहता एंड ऑल्सो ऑन माई ओन बिकॉज फॉर टूडेज मॉर्निंग सेशन which is on the subject of significant beneficial ownership mr atul is having some pre occupation that is why he is not able to join if time permits he might uh, join i am not very sure about it today as you are aware this subject is a very very interesting subject and there are a lot of compliance issues are involved especially to the company secretary point of view because the background of this beneficial ownership rules which actually came into in order to identify the ultimate beneficial owner who is having a controlling interest either by way of the equity or either by way of the voting right or is having a controlling interest whatever it is that is what the whole idea is because you are all aware there has been lot of scam which has been happening money laundering has been happening many scams are there ultimately who is the real person who is getting out of it is unknown actually in many cases companies act and as well as the sebi they have tried their level best to block this loophole they brought in various things even they tried with the related party transaction if you are aware in the related party transaction also in the financial statements you know to declare all the related parties to you including subsidiary companies associate companies group companies and they brought in the concept there also you know to declare the ultimate beneficial owner ubo this was also there but some other whatever you do people have a way of finding out a loopholes of the law and they try to do unethical practices so with this this latest thing which has actually come beneficial ownership here what has happened is the regulator has taken little more precautionary steps to ensure to put the onus on the company itself to identify who is the beneficial owner that is the crux of the matter here because you know what happens is normally if you go through the rules on when it was introduced there was a lot of chaos subsequently there was a clarificatory note and even the rules have been actually amended those of you who are in the employment you will be knowing it what happened actually when this rule was introduced so really speaking what has happened it has got the two pole one thing is there okay if the company is having 10% and above security interest of a particular entity the company has to actually go back to them and they have to find out who is the beneficial ownership is there that is the responsibility which is actually costed because earlier the beneficial ownership is declared the company has to file the form if the company filing the form it is okay company doesn't file the form then action is taken by the regulator that was the issue now that is not the case case is the owners is put you to find out who is the beneficial ownership what are the steps you have taken to finding up the beneficial ownership you ensure first at the first time if you are not done your job even you will be penalized this is the way the rule has actually come today basically it is to arrest the money laundering and also various financial scandals which have been happening by taking this particular route today in fact we have two eminent people one who has spent a lot of time in many corporates and having a practical experience dealing with the regulatory authorities and the other speaker the panelist is actually a practicing company secretary who has established his own firm and who is in the practice for last one decade or so let me a pleasure of introducing these two evidence panelists mr sudhakar i don't think i need to specifically introduce him he is very well known figure across the country he has been delivering various seminar lectures etc many of us will be definitely knowing he has been associated with the reliance group comp reliance company the reliance group of companies and uh, he has got a ext 
extensive experience in a compliance matter. Those of you who have listened to his lectures, etc., not this thing, you will recall it. I don't have to talk anything more than this because we know him very well. Hats off to you, Mr. Sudhagar. Welcome to the Thank section. You, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Thrupal, he is basically in southern part of the country, one of the good, <coughs> what do you call, climatical place, Bangalore. He is actually from Bangalore and he has got his own home established, Thrupal Gorji and Associate LLB. And he has been associated with the various companies where he is actually rendering the practical solutions to the companies. And he is a BCOM graduate, graduate, and he has actually a fellow membership of our institute. And he has actually done a lot of work for the institute. In fact, he was one of the person who was actually administered the ICSA Premier and Company Law Volume 1 and 1 2. He is actually a, one of the person who has actually made the commentary on the Company Act of 2013, which has been brought, brought out by the ICSA CCGRT from Melapur through the New Delhi ICSA or Parent Institute. And he has actually been associated with the ICSA CCGRT and he has been also delivering various lectures and seminar and his participation is actually immense in various forums and workshops and seminars, not only our institute, but also from our professional institute, like his Chartered Accountant Institute, Cost Accountant Institute, some of the IAM management schools, etc., and all those things also. And he actually had a very vast experience in appearing in front of the various regulatory authorities, let it be ROC, let it be RD, let it be National Company Law Tribunal. And he is also one of the insolvency professional IP registered in the IBC code. And he has handled very recently, I believe, almost about three, four insolvency cases. And he is also well versed in the IPR and other things. And he is also associated with the liquidation issues of the companies, etc. He has got a very, very vast experience. I have a pleasure in welcoming Mr. Thrupal to this session. Thank you very thank much, you, sir. sir. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. I will not be taking much of a time on this, but before we start the session, I would like to definitely, definitely like to hear comments from Mr. Sudhagar and also Mr. Thrupal. Over to Mr. Sudhagar, please. Thank you very much, Bala, sir. Uh, and uh, good morning to all. Good morning, Tripal and Kaushik Bhai. After a long morning, time, I see you, Kaushik Bhai. In fact, uh, the Companies Amendment Act 2017 has overhauled the Section 90. Subsequent to that, we all know on June 13, 2018, the SBO rules have been notified. That there was a lot of ambiguities were there in those rules and a lot of aberrations were there. And the regulator got convinced that the rules cannot be implemented the way they were drafted and notified. That's why the rules were put on hold. And after that, the initiative has been asked to study that and to make a representation that how the rules are to be amended. In fact, I was privileged to be uh, from the ICSI side myself Mrs. Savitri Parikh and a few others, we could represent ICSI before the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and could, I, mean, I could apprise the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and other officials thereof about the difficulties, what will be there if we are implementing the rules in total. In fact, I must say that with all uh, modesty at our command, I'm very happy to say that 90% of the recommendations given by ICSI were accepted by MCA and they have been virtually incorporated in the revised rules. The rules have not been completely withdrawn, but the rules, majority of the rules have been amended. In addition to that, I must say that even till date, if any section in the Companies Act 2013 is a complicated section, that is only section 90. How many people have understanding of this section even as on date, with all due regards, I have my own apprehensions about it. Somehow, because of whatever the reasons it is working for Reliance or 
my own interest or whatever it is, I could have an in-depth study of this particular section and privileged to be invited across the length and breadth of the country by virtually all chapters and 32 presentations, if I am not, like yesterday I was counting, 32 presentations I have made across the country for this. Great, sir. Great. Heads up to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, why I'm saying this thing is not to boast about myself, but what I'm trying to say is about the complexities what are involved in this particular thing. With every presentation, let me say with uh, utmost modesty, I got the clarity, more and more clarity, more and more clarity I got this particular section. In fact, today, Nupur is making the, she got the courage to make this presentation for all of us, and I must appreciate at such an young age, she took the lead that she will make the presentation. No doubt about it, that she did a good effort. In fact, I have gone through her presentation myself, and uh, but wherever I have to pitch in and to clarify certain points, I will do that. And as of now, I mean, at this point of time, I will give a pass and invite Thiripal to give his opening remarks. And as the session progresses, I will be adding the wherever I have to. Thank you very much once again. Yeah. Yes. Good morning to all. Uh, I thank the Mehta and Mehta company to just just one partners. just one point about the Thiripal. In fact, I must say that Thiripal is. A southern hero, as Balasar has mentioned, I don't know across the oh, no. others, they know it or not, but Tiripal is one of the eminent company secretaries no. of South, and South, no need to say about him. Whereas uh, others, if you don't know, especially in North and West uh, members, Tiripal is a very promising and uh, one of the eminent company secretaries of our institute. Yes, Tiripal, please go ahead. And that a dear is, friend, of course. Thank you. So it is my privilege to have this, uh, share this dais with uh, both eminent, uh, as in many, as I have told, no lot of seminars, webinars, or even uh, physical interactions with Sudhakar sir. And as far as the Balakrishnan sir, I had uh, daily at least one article, you know, received from him and then read almost all. So I'm truly honored and privileged to share the dais with them virtually. So I thank the Mehta Mehta again to give me this opportunity. I don't know whether I can, as sir rightly pointed out about section 19. So whether I'm able to throw some light or not, but I'm going to learn many things out of these deliberations. So I'm ready to learn so many things. See, as far as the, uh, my knowledge about this uh, section 90 and 89, I believe 89 also there in the card today to discuss. So my understanding is very clear about the 89, but 90, I need to get more clarity for that with the discussion. As far as the 89 is concerned, uh, under 1956 Act, we have a section 187C. And 187C is basically to identify the binami transactions, technically, to see whether the registered owner, whether it's an individual or a company, really is the beneficial owner. That was the idea. And uh, to identify it, the obligation is imposed on the registered owner to disclose the details about the real, uh, real the beneficial owner. And the real beneficial owner, again, is supposed to acknowledge the disclosure made by the registered owner and submit a form to the company. An intern company used to submit a form clubbing both the disclosures made by the company to the government. As far as my understanding is concerned, that section is simply a disclosure made by both the parties. Intern company used to act as a, a postman job and hand out that information to the government. Look at that section. There is no obligation on the company in turn either to do investigation or to identify whether he is the person is a real owner or he is the ostensible owner or the who someone else is the beneficial owner, all those things, that kind of investigation is not there as far as the section 89 is concerned. No need to do any investigation. You will work as a postman. Look at the benefits that are there. Now they have defined in section 10. 
for the section 89 and uh, section 90 purpose, they have defined a common definition. Of course, that is inclusive definition. And uh, they have not defined what is the beneficial interest. They simply said that receiving of dividend, voting right, voting power, or something may lead to be considered as a beneficial interest. So you are supposed to make the disclosure. The 89 is legally, you have to justify why the shares are not held by the beneficial owner on his own. If you are not able to justify, probably government will take up the case of a binami. The cases you must have seen like creating 100% subsidiary through nominees. And the nominee is supposed to make a disclosure under 89 saying that I am not the real owner. The real owner is the holding company. This is the one of the instance for the, you must be filing the return. Similarly, in case of partnership firm, if the partnership firm is the beneficial owner, as you know, the partnership firm is not a legal entity, it cannot hold the shares on its own. So partners should own and then they should make a disclosure. Similarly, like a um, minor. So wherever legally you can't hold the shares in a company as a registered owner, and those cases, you are being a beneficial owner, the legal owner and beneficial owner is supposed to make a disclosure to the company and the company duty is there only to inform to the government by filing certain form and neither legal owner nor the beneficial owner can make any command on the company saying that you declare a dividend this way or you declare the bonus shares like this or you ensure the rights of the shareholders will be, I am the rights, you give me the chance. No, neither registered owner can, or can give a command on the company not the uh, beneficial owner can give any direction by using the section 89. See, tomorrow if I'm going to issue an uh, example like rights issue, whom I should offer the share? As per the law, the 62 one says here, who is a member as on the so on so that being equity shareholder, you are supposed to make the disclosure only to him. Of course, he can make a renunciation that is altogether different. Similarly, tomorrow you are going to make a dividend whom I should make? Should I make a dividend to the holding company or should I make a dividend to the nominee? Your duty is there to make a dividend to the registered owner. Of course, registered owner can give a direction by using the dividend section saying that you pay the dividend to my holding company. That means what I'm trying to say, 89, by using the 89, neither the registered owner nor the beneficial owner can give any direction on the company and company need not to follow any direction even if it is given. That is simple section 89. 89 is like that. Of course, they helped us to identify what is the beneficial interest. Of course, there, whenever there is a change, you are also required to make the change. That is a simple section 89. I'm not finding uh, much difficulty in understanding that section. And there is no comparison between two, 89 and 9. Even if you try to make comparison, something it will be more complicated. It will become more complicated. Both are two different sections and both are existing their own different purpose. 90 is as rightly sir pointed out clearly indicating the person. It is like a drama. Our early olden days used to play the drama with uh, uh, you know threads. The person behind the thread, uh, you know, curtain will be using the thread and then it will come puppets or something, you know, it comes the show will be outside and you see that, you know, the dolls are dancing, technical dolls are not dancing. Dolls are dancing because of the, those threads lifted by the person behind it. So 19 is nothing but they want to identify the person who is you not know, playing with those threads. That is exactly the 90. Of course, more complicated, as I said, rightly, 90 can be, they have identified clearly, like one should be through not an individual shareholder. First of all, you are an individual shareholder, then no need. In general, 90 is not applicable. So other than individual, like you take the example of like a, a company, a body corporate, or LLP, or a trust, or a you know, partnership firm, or any other investment vehicle, or any other entity, owning this, you know, being a registered owner in the company, that the entity, if it is controlled by someone else, they are given what is that significant beneficial interest or it may be control or it may be the what is that shareholding majority stake all those things if that entry is controlled by some individual that individual is considered to be the person behind playing the profession 
the government wants to know who is playing these puppets, who is controlling the shareholding in this particular company. The controlling is legally valid, whereas in case of 89, controlling is not legally valid. You can't control it by using that. Whereas in case of 90, controlling is legally valid. Like you can have like holding company below subsidiary, subsidiaries to subsidiary. These are a legal structure which is allowed by the government, by the law in any country for that matter. You can have and you can control legally. Now, who is controlling that they want to bring with various purposes? So with a small remarks, let us listen to the Nupur. She has made a wonderful presentation as uh, in yesterday. Let us you know, invite and listen to her. And if there are any deliberations on this, I'm ready to you know, share my knowledge and get gain knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trupal. To yes. add what Trupal has actually said, Section 89 is talking only the beneficial interest. If the registered owner is not the real owner, who is the really the beneficial interested owner? Even in 89, even a single share is registered. That who is the registered owner, that declaration is clearly required to be given. But when it comes to Section 90, there is a threshold limit is there 10%. In fact, earlier the threshold limit used to be 25% or something. Now they have reduced to 10%. And if you people would have gone through it, I think I'm sure many of our professional colleagues would have gone through this uh, section. Initially, the rules which was introduced, it was actually titled, titled as investigation of beneficial owner of share in certain companies. <laughs> and subsequently, the amended rule has brought in replacing a word certain companies to in any company. That is the thing they have widened the scope of this particular rule. Many of you may be aware of this amendment. And the very important thing is the government has really, really shifted the onus on the company. That is the thing. Company has to actually find out. Earlier, which was not the case, but this amendment, company has to actually throw the responsibility of the company to investigate, find out if the company failed to do that then they are also labeled for the penal action. This is what I wanted to just add to what Mr. Tripal has actually said. Let us go to presentation. Mr. Nipur, you can take over, please. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So first of all, I would like to thank Mehta and Mehta team for giving me this opportunity. And secondly, I must say that I am really grateful to be working with such eminent uh, faculties and eminent uh, panel of experts, I can say, which have tremendous amount of expertise and experience as well and they provide continuous support to us and to make this assignment a big success so thank you so much sir so we'll start with the presentation yeah good morning Jabhanathan. welcome <laughs> good morning good morning so our today's topic is an insight on the significant beneficial ownership of shares so as rightly uh, Mr. Bala said, the concept was introduced by the MCA to identify the specific individuals or saying natural persons who indirectly are controlling certain companies through various la layers and artificial entities. And MCA introduced uh, significant beneficial ownership rules in on 13th January 2018, pursuant to section 90 of the Companies Act as well. Later, uh, ascertaining certain difficulties in implementation processes, it also substituted or amended the rules to, uh, with effect from uh, 11th of February 2019. So originally, uh, even Companies Act 1956 also considered the uh, concept of beneficial ownership in order to uh, identify the Benami holders like Tirupal sir also rightly mentioned and the uh, provisions were under section 187c for the declarations and 187d for uh, you know central government to investigate certain beneficial owners in in certain amount of cases so companies act 2013 replaced these sections to section 89 and 90 with similar provisions and further amending the same with an intent to shift the owners from the central government to the individuals and the companies as well to uh, find out the declarations or information of, on the beneficial ownership. In fact, in 1956 Act, 
many of the company they had a class in their memorandum and article of association that directors need to hold qualification shares which was actually required earlier subsequently that was actually withdrawn it is no more mandatory requirement at all so invariably lot of companies they used to have a qualification share allotted from the parent company or other main companies etc a few shares maybe five share 10 share etc and other thing and all that time people used to file although the director is actually holding the share but the beneficial interest of this share is actually not the director it goes to this particular entity or something like that 187c that form was used by many companies at that particular time that was the case later on as tripal has put it to arrest the binami transaction which came when 2013 has come the development has taken place yeah go ahead Yes, sir. So it has quite been a very global concern, at it, as in it has been a considerably important scenario to ascertain to combat the evil aspects of the financial crimes like money laundering, drug trafficking, or corruption. We can say tax evasion as well. So there are certain uh, other financial frauds as well. So it is very imminent to uh, the com countries as well worldwide to ascertain or uh, appoint or you know establish certain authorities that would help in combating these financial crimes and provide certain guidelines to ascertain them. So financial action task force is also one of them and it is an intergovernmental body which sets international standards and policies to its member countries and it has also provided recommendations on transparency and of uh, and beneficial ownership of legal persons as well so india is also a member of fatf even the sbo rules recognize uh, recommendations of fatf and india has been committed to their recommendations way before 2013 act was passed so even the us has formed a financial crimes enforcement network which is a bureau of department of treasury and uh, it also collects and analyzes the financial transactions in US to curb the or combat the financial crimes as well. So FinCEN in last year, they come up with, uh, came up with two rules. One was for the corporations to report to the FinCEN about all the information of beneficial owners. And it also proposed beneficial ownership to federal agencies and also to uh, also how it would uh, protect the database as well so before going into the intricacies of beneficial ownership we'll just brief up a bit about uh, the simple or the basic aspects of membership so membership as defined by the companies act would mean a a subscriber to the memorandum deemed to have agreed to become member entered as a member in the register of member Secondly, every person who agrees in writing to become a member, name uh, name of who is uh, entered in the register of members. Other, every in case of DMAT shares, every person holding shares of a company whose name is entered as beneficial owner in the records of the depository. So basically, here are two things we should note that one is an agreement, which is in writing. And the second part would be his name is entered in the register of members or the records of depository. So basically, if at all it is a case of uh, unregistered transferee, the transferee cannot claim any right or enforce, enforce any uh, dividend or so until his name is entered in the register of member. So coming to the uh, membership concepts and practicalities as in who all can become members. So where it is concerned about minor, he cannot acquire shares as we all know that he... Uh, he is not competent to contract. He can acquire shares through the uh, guardian's name and he may inherit shares. So concern about a partnership firm. A partnership firm is not a member and uh, it, is, it is not considered under the purview of person and it cannot be a member. However, the partners in uh, partners in the Partnership firm can register uh, can be registered as a member as member joint shareholders in their individual names. On the contrary, LLP uh, is a body corporate and it can be considered as a member. So coming to the so coming to the joint shareholders part. 
so as per the definition of uh, private companies uh, joint shareholders together shall be treated as a single member considering the restriction on the number of uh, maximum number of uh, members and for public limited companies every joint shareholder is treated as a single member a cooperative society is not a body corporate but it is a person and a separate legal entity so it is capable of becoming member huf is a person according to the income tax act and there is no prohibition under the companies act for uh, an huf to become a member and the shares can be held in the name of the karta so coming to the legal representative part so uh, in previous act the supreme court has mentioned that that the property of the deceased person vests in the legal representative and he should be permitted to act for the deceased person for the purpose of transfer of shares but he would not be acting as a member unless his name is registered in the register of members in the place of the deceased member coming to the ownership aspect so basically there are two types of owners one is a registered owner and the other one is the beneficial owner so registered owner is one whose name is entered in the registered register of members and he may or may not hold beneficial interest in such shares and a beneficial owner is a person who is entitled to all the benefits uh, that are attached to the shares plus his name is not entered in the register of members so we'll understand what beneficial owner is according to certain authorities so income tax has uh, not specifically mentioned or defined the term beneficial owner but but it has mentioned it under the uh, section 139 to mean an individual or a person who uh, who provides the consideration for the asset in concern secondly pmla defines a beneficial owner to be the natural person who ultimately owns or controls a client or the person on whose behalf a transaction is being made it also includes a person who exercises ultimate effective control over a juridical person so sebi also has identified a beneficial ownership concept it has uh, issued guidelines on identification of beneficial ownership uh according to the master circular that it has passed in december uh, 31st 2010 it has provided the definition of beneficial ownership and it is the same as per the pmla act like we have already seen and the circular also mandated all the registered intermediaries to obtain sufficient information from their clients this was to identify and verify the beneficial owner who are controlling the securities uh, account later it also uh, prescribed uniform kyc requirements to the securities market and uh, in 2011 also it provided uniform guidelines on identification of beneficial owner in consultation with the government of india uh, and that was passed in the circular 2013 so now what is a beneficial interest uh, that is actually bifurcating uh, registered owner and beneficial owner all about so beneficial interest as per the companies act and for the purposes of section 89 and section 90 uh, is uh, in a share includes directly or indirectly which would mean direct holding or by indirect holding by a uh, via layers so this would be through any contract or arrangement or otherwise the right or entitlement of a person alone or acting together so this would be an exercise to or cause to exercise any or all rights attached to the share or participating in the dividend or other distribution we'll just take an example on understanding the direct and indirect relationship so uh, basically one, one yes, prasad has actually puts a comment here partnership firm is a legal entity subject to enrollment under indian partnership act 1932 to answer prasad under the company act very specifically partnership uh, firm is actually not a, a recognized as the legal entity in their own name but uh, however the partners as pointed out by nupur they can become a member either individually or jointly or whatever it is partnership firm as such cannot that is why the llp has come out llp is recognized as the legal entity who can actually become a member go ahead yes sir 
So, Mr. Y holds thirty yes, percent shares. Just one minute, Bala sir. What you have said further to add that? Yeah. As far as LLP is concerned, it is a body corporate under the Companies Act, but for the purpose of Section ninety, yeah, LLP is not a body corporate. Yeah, that it's is right. You're right. Even in the rules itself, you're right. So, Mr. Y holds 30% uh, in A Limited and Mr. Z holds 100% shares in B Limited. And B Limited again holds 70% of shares in A Limited. So, basically, Y is a direct owner and Mr. Z is indirect owner of A Limited. So, laws relating to beneficial ownership include Section 89, Section 90, read with the uh, company significant beneficial ownership rules as per the companies at 2013. Coming to the provisions of section 89. So firstly, a registered owner has to make declaration to the company about the beneficial owner and the beneficial interest. And it shall be filed within 30 days from the date of his entry in the register in form MGT4. Again, a beneficial owner has to disclose his nature of interest and the particulars of registered owner uh, within 13, 30 days from the date of uh, acquiring such interest in form MGT-5. So, uh, a company, whenever the disclosures are made, it shall take note of the declarations and make, make uh, uh, the entries into the register of members and file the return of the same with the registrar within 30 days of receipt of such declaration in form MGT-6. And he is also has to declare the changes which are taking place on a periodical basis if there are yes, any sir. changes. Yeah. Yes, sir. So central government is empowered to make rules uh, as per the provisions in regard to this pro these provisions as well. And wherever a beneficial owner fails to make any de declaration to the company, he shall have uh, he sh he cannot enforce any right attached to the uh, shares in concern. So now this, these disclosures do not take away any rights of the register uh, shareholder, as the Rupal sir rightly mentioned. The there is the a, a, an owner cannot uh, direct or order the company to provide the rights or the uh, dividends available on the shares to the beneficial owner directly, but he may direct the company to pay dividend in favor of beneficial owner. Also, he can uh, renounce the rights that are issued to him to the beneficial owner. And as far as bonus is concerned, he can follow the procedure of transfer of shares to transfer the shares to the beneficial owner. Yeah, to clarify here, that beneficial yes, owner, sir. not the registered owner, they are not using this section. They are not using this section to enforce their right. The okay. denunciation is used under section 62, yes. so 1A. Yes. Similarly, dividend, uh, the declaration of dividend and in his order, it is written clearly in the dividend section. So, not under this section, they can use their rights. Yes, sir, not under this section. <laughs> Ashish Mehta is asking a question. If the registered owner, say, nominee of holding company dies, what would be the process of recording the change in the registered owner? So can you repeat? If the registered owner, that is the nominee of the holding company dies, what would be the process of recording the change in the registered owner? Yeah, transmission is technical. It is a transmission. We don't have different person for the nominee share transfer, whatever it is, section 56. We have to follow the transmission provision. No, I think the, here he is saying the registered owner he is talking, he is using the word entity holding company. So, which means it appears to my mind that company has actually nominated somebody to the registered owner there. So if yeah, he dies or something like that, I think yeah, they, understood. they understood, can understood, they can renominate somebody else. Yeah. yeah. See, section one eighty seven yeah. allows the company to create subsidiaries. Yeah. Like hundred percent subsidiaries, it is written clearly in case of uh, private limited company one nominee, and in case of public limited company, it can have another six nominees. Okay, these nominees are not beneficial owners. 
So they are supposed to comply this section 89. Yeah. If nominee ceases to be nominee, uh, technically uh, the legal heirs of the nominees, they are not beneficial owners. So the beneficial owner can get the, he will be the legal representative for that particular debt. So he will be executing, maybe you can nominate another person. It is a transmission, not the transfer. Hmm. Shares will be transmitted from the one nominee to the new nominee appointed by the company. Yeah, that is it. Well, as a Pranjal Desai uh, wanted to add this, uh, the format uh, that is provided in form MGT 4 and 5, they have a, a section for change in beneficial owner or registered owner, same. So in case uh, if the, the person dies, you can file this application uh, mentioning the details of change and uh, therein uh, for the reason of change, you can mention that the person has died and attached a death certificate as well. And then the process can be taken up, like change in registered owner can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. so moving ahead with the penal provisions under section 89. Uh, before you yes, uh, shift to the penal provisions, since we are talking about section 187, let me say about one or two things here that in fact, as we all know, 187 says the investments of the company has to be in the name of the company only. And the only exception or exemption provided under the proviso to 187.1 is that I'm just reading the words which has to be very carefully observed because during my presentations, I have noticed that several flaws and several non-compliances by the participants. I will explain that what is that. The proviso reads like this, provided that the company may hold any shares in a subsidiary company. It need not be a wholly owned subsidiary. In a subsidiary also, it can happen. Some people have an impression that only in case of a wholly owned subsidiary, 187 exemption is applicable. It is not so. It is applicable even to subsidiary companies also. Now, in case of a subsidiary, in the name of a nominee or nominees of the company, if it is so necessary to do so, that means only where it is necessary, then only you can have the nominees. Otherwise, the company has to continue to own the shares in its own name. To ensure that the number of members of the subsidiary company is not reduced below the statutory limit. Yes. So the exemption provided is only to ensure that the minimum number of members are maintained. Yes. To that extent, only the exemption is there. So that means what, suppose if I am having a wholly owned subsidiary, A Limited is a company and B Limited is its a subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary. So A is the 100% shareholder and B Limited has to have seven members. So the remaining six members will be holding one, one share each as nominee holders. Several people were not knowing this concept. The nominee shareholders were holding 100 shares 200 shares, 1,000 shares also like that, which is not correct. Only to the extent of that membership mm -hmm. is required, you have to hold means you cannot have the nominee holder cannot hold more than one share, number one. Similarly, you cannot have more than six members. You can have only one is the main company and the six nominees only. One of the participants was telling me, sir, sometimes the quorum problem will come because we need five members for the quorum. These six nominees, my senior officials are there, they travel quite often. So for the purpose of quorum, we have 10 nominees. You cannot have that. You can have only maximum in case of a public company, six nominees only. They have to hold only one share each. Second thing, by abundant caution, normally people, what they do is, they put the uh, that shares of the nominee jointly held with the parent company, right? That is because the nominee by the nominee shareholder should not say why okay, this share is owned by me only tomorrow. Number one. So when you are doing that, most of the people are committing a mistake. Is that putting the name of the company first and the individual second? It is wrong because the moment your name of the company is first mess, it will be considered as one folio only. If you want to count as different folios, you have to have, I mean, different number of members. You have to have first name is the individual, 
second name is the the joint name is the company then only it will be counted as six members if the first holder is the company it will be considered as one member only this is also a lot of uh, people have committed this mistake then certain questions of course have come is by that they have not filed the forms and all those things what we have to do not do now and all blah 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 like that so this is one major thing that please ensure you should not have more than the number of minimum people required number one and now the question comes that uh, suppose in case of subsidiary say for example a limited is there b limited is it subsidiary not a wholly owned subsidiary because it is subsidiary because a limited is holding 51% in the b limited and the other two holders are holding say for example the remaining money now it is a public company because that that particular uh, the subsidiary is a subsidiary of a public company because it is a public company it has to have seven members but actual shareholders are only three how about the remaining four so the remaining four can be the nominees of any of these three companies if they are the shareholders but please remember that an individual cannot nominate suppose say for example a limited is there are tripal and sudhakar are the other two shareholders only three are there you have to have seven members so four more no, the shareholders are required for that subsidiary then you cannot the tripal and sudhakar cannot appoint the nominees only a limited has to appoint its nominees so these are small intricacies which are mm -hmm. in, uh, was called as you know, the intricacies are there as far as your section 89 and 187 is concerned the present 187 is as 12 49 and present uh, uh, i mean and okay that 89 is as 12 187c these are the interlinkages so that we our understanding can be better than that go ahead uh, nupur sorry there is one it's comment has come I, there is one comment has come sir, they say sir, I have a... yeah yes please sir i have one small query yeah uh, my uh, limited company is closely held company And subsidiary has only one uh, nominee, hundred percent subsidiary has only one name nominee. So, do we need to increase the number of nominee there also? Sir, come back again. I couldn't understand your question. What is that, uh, Shabufa? Subsidiary of a public company having two shareholders. One is yes, a company. Subsidiary of a public is company is a public company. You know, so you have to have seven yes. members. How you will cover that now? Especially the public limited yeah. company, E G M general meeting quorum should also be complied. No? Uh, sir, uh, my uh, li li uh, closely held company, limited company has seven member, but subsidiary is a private limited company. Do I need to have seven nominees there also? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. You have to because otherwise, how you will have the quorum? For general the, meeting, the general meeting, you have to have five members as the quorum. Because some people were interpreting that in case of a, uh, the private limited company, which is subsidiary of a company, can continue to have two members and two directors and all, it is not correct. That company may continue to have that word private, but still it is uh, for the purpose of the act. It has to continue to apply all the provisions correct. as if it is a public company. Only sometimes it can have is the share transfer restriction rights. That's it. nothing beyond that okay. some okay. some people say you can have two okay. members how you will comply with the quorum then quorum you require five members in case of a public company right okay. okay and it okay. is very clear it is very clear from the regulators point of view also that in case if anybody is not having they will receive uh, sometime or the other a shokas notice okay. only transfer yeah. restrictions in the articles you can continue to have that okay yeah, technically okay. thank you thank you Yeah, as far as the new act is concerned, there are only two baskets for companies, uh, public and private basket only are there. One is uh, as far as the old act, you no, know, there was one more basket called a subsidiary of a private company, which is a subsidiary of a public company. And throughout the act, that expression, the phrase was used throughout the act. They they were saying that public company. Then next to that, a private company which is subsidiary of a public company. Few sections were having this expression. Few sections were not having expression. That means, as per the old act was concerned, there were three baskets were there. As per the compliance was concerned, now you have only two baskets. 
one is a public company basket other one is a private company basket so compliance yeah. also should be done according to so you are talking about that old act the provision of 43a or something like that deemed public company is, is no that correct yeah that was exactly deemed deemed to public yeah. company here also they use word deemed to be deemed but public now company. that that falls in the basket of the public company only okay now there is one comment has come proviso to section 1871 what can be the scenario where it will be necessary for a subsidy to ensure number of members are not reduced now i am not getting the question exactly just in what exactly it was, in your mind it was sudhakar sir already explained we are yes. necessary to have minimum two in case of private subsidy being a private company And seven in case of public company, sir already explained. Necessary to have that number, you can have the nominee. Some nominee can hold each nominee one one share because of the section. I think uh, that is the section uh, five four four as per the in incorporation M O A drafting. In that section is written to become a member, you need to hold minimum one share at least. So that is the reason, sir told. So here the same way. reduction again you have to look with the section 3a 3a says clearly reduction of member there is a unlimited liability all those things are there reduction means less than 2 or less than 7 whenever there is a change in the nominee should the sh4 be executed and the consideration also be mentioned there yeah this there is no other option uh, god act has not given any different process for transfer of share between one nominee to other nominee The search for should be executed. Of course, consideration. How much you will say? Whether it is nil uh, consideration, all those things will work because it is between the company. See, for company, uh, the subsidiary nothing to do with the share transfer. Whether the money is moving from one shareholder or other shareholder is immaterial. It has to have a share transfer form called search for. Duly executed by both the parties and duly stamped. If you look at the section fifty six. There is no exception. you should have execution i feel there is some exception only for the government companies as per as the government companies exemption notification there is an exemption if the nominees are there like ias officers if, if they are getting moved from that company like except is yours there is some exception is given to the government companies without executing sh4 you can move the share transfers that exception is there but not for all companies subsidy companies can participate in meeting via authorized representative subsidy companies can participate meeting of the other company by appointing authorized representative but subsidy companies meeting they need five members no if it is a public company yeah maybe quorum in the subsidy company can be through the authorized representative that's what he is trying to tell us Okay, it can be. Subsidy, I think SS SS two clarify. Uh, hey, you can you can, the, you can appoint you can appoint company. an authorized representative, but one company cannot appoint five authorized representatives, and it, they cannot be counted yeah. as five members present at the yeah. meeting. Okay. If it is five companies, they can authorize only one representative. One person. When he attends the meeting, he will be counted as five. five. But one company cannot appoint five authorized representatives, and they will not be counted as five for that particular purpose. No. So that is not correct. So that means SS one clearly clarifies in the event. Suppose you have a uh, shareholders are seven companies. And they say minimum quorum means two people should be there. In Uh, means it should be considered as a meeting. Two individuals should be there. One among them can be other is a representative for balance five companies. It is allowed. So two quorum is must even you have a seven companies. Absolutely, private company of a foreign public company need to have two or seven members. Yeah, see this I have already explained you. Uh, the concept of old section four, subsection seven. If anyone is aware of it, uh, that section was there to identify the a subsidy of a foreign company depending upon the share holding in that particular company. The old section was like this. 
section 4, subsection 7. If anyone has 1956 act, you can read it. If the entire paid up share capital of the Indian company is not held by one or more body corporates, incorporate outside India. Okay, if the capital is not held by the body corporates, one or more outside India, that means if any of the capital is held by any individual other than body corporate, then that company is considered to be a public company if these body corporates, which are from other country, if they are the public companies as per those jurisdictions, this company also will become a public company. If the entire capital is held by a listed company in the US, like Infos, like you, you have a Microsoft in Microsoft US, which is a listed company in the US, and Microsoft US creates an Indian subsidiary wherein 100% share capital is held by the Microsoft subsidiary, Microsoft holding through its nominee, then even in the old act also, that is not a public company. The old idea was there to protect the interest of that individual. That individual interest they want to protect, they say that is considered to be a public company. A similar provision is not there in the, 19, in the 2013 Act. They removed that basket. Now, whatever you have created under this particular Act, that is 2013 Act, if you have created as a public company or you have created as a private company, that is only considered to be public and private. We don't need to look at the who is holding shares in your company, which is a foreign company. No, no need. To. What is the status of that foreign company? You need to be verified. Even a foreign listed, like Japan listed companies holding the shares in Indian company, whether they are holding, you know, under it is a private company under companies. Because we are not worried about the to regulate the Japan listed company. We are not worried about. It. So you have only two baskets. That too, depending upon the Indian companies being holding companies, not foreign companies. We don't need to look at the foreign companies. So Absolutely. purely, yeah. all those companies will become, a, if they are created as a private companies in India, they are private companies. If they are created as public companies in India, they are public companies. That's all. Absolutely. Only for Indian company case, we should look at whether the Indian holding company is a public or private to classify the subsidiary whether it is a public or private, not beyond that. Subsidy of a public company is always deemed to be a public company, whether it is a private company by virtue. I think correct. this is what he has put. This is correct, absolutely. Then there is another question is coming. As per section 187, the nominee can hold shares only for maintaining the statutory requirement. In case of the private limited company, there are two shareholders, including one as a nominee shareholder. What in case of the right to issue, the shareholders renounces their share to another person. Now, in total, there are three members. Is this non-compliant and do we need to withdraw the nominee? Answering yes. Yes. Answer, yeah. yes. Answer should be yes. The issue is that if you look at the section 62 1J, the renunciation, right to renunciation is subject to the provisions of your AOA. Okay. A private limited company, if it is uh, creating any subsidiary, you know, you should ensure that that the nominee has no right to renounce to any other's payment. So that should be arrested. Otherwise, he may do it. No, no, one minute, one minute, What the question here is that suppose it is permitted. In fact, I say for all purposes, the nominee holder technically he has a right to renounce unless until yes. it is prohibited by the articles. That is the difference. Articles. But yes. But actually, whether you can restrict the members' rights and all, whether the company has to recognize, it is a different case altogether. So let us take it for all purposes. The nominee has a right to renounce his right shares, right? He can right. apply also if he needs. But yes. normally what happens, as I have mentioned to you, a nominee cannot have more than one share. That's why what we do normally in our company is that whenever the rights are announced, we take a letter from the nominee holder that he is not interested in applying for the right shares. Okay, that is number one. Number two, suppose the company itself has renounced the share to a third person. So now the company has three shareholders. One is the company itself, the private limited company, what the query, the querist has referred to. One is the private company. 
second is the nominee holder third is the renunciation the, the new shareholder who is going renounce. to join the company because now three members are there immediately that the the company has to withdraw the nominee it has to cancel the nominee and it has to get back that one share to its account otherwise yes. it will be a non compliance then it what will is, cease to be, it will cease to be only one subsidiary correct. it will be a subsidiary alone what is the remedy if more than the required number of the nominees are appointed in a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign company? See, what we need to, I think Sudhakar sir told clearly that 187C uses the word company. Company means section 2, class 20. Company incorporated in the Companies Act. So 187 is there to regulate Indian companies. Hold Indian company means being a holding company, not a foreign company. Foreign company can have too many nominees. Indian like 187 is not applicable. 187 is not applicable. Okay. Nupur, you can proceed. Yes, sir. So coming to the penal provisions of section 89. So basically, wherever a person uh, fails to make declaration as per the section 89, subsection 1, 2, and 3. So he will be liable for a penalty of rupees 25,000 and rupees 200 if for every continuing day as in for uh, till the default continues. Uh, wherever a company fails to file a return as per section uh, 89.6, every company and its officer in default shall be liable for a penalty of rupees 1,000 for every day that is subject to a uh, maximum of 5 lakh rupees per company and 2 lakh rupees in every uh, in case of officer in default. One thing is very clear, officer and yeah. default, wherever it is their fine penalty is levied, they have to pay from their own pocket because yes. normally the order very categorically says the money has to be paid individually out of their own sources. Please keep this in mind. So I, I, I'm, even, I'm even worried about tomorrow they may add in the orders that auditors should verify whether really the amount is paid <laughs> from this packet, the responsibility will be on the auditor also. I'm thinking it, they may go beyond. You know? That is bound to happen. 100% it is bound to happen because what happens is, to be very frank with you, in practically, some or other people found out the way and the company finances through the people, you know, consultants, etc. and other thing and all. That is what it is happening in many places. Practically, this also will get arrested actually so that the people will feel the impact. Yeah. But there is a D, D and O policy is there. I think uh, they can compensate through the D and O policy if it is permitted. Yeah, that is true because many companies, they voluntarily, they say D and O company. In fact, even the LODR regulations is brought out. Now, initially it is brought out for the uh, thousand classified companies, etc. It will get extended down the line. Nirpal, for your information, penal provisions or penalties are not covered under the end of policy. Penalty okay. means you have, com you have committed an offense. Okay? okay. So you can only get the legal cost, but not the pay pay penal provisions. DO is okay. not covering that penal provisions. Litigation cost you will get. Yes, litigation cost you will get. That's it. Penalty cost you will not get. Yeah. Yes, Nupur, proceed. Yes, okay. So coming to the main provisions of significant beneficial ownership under section 80, uh, under section 90. So basically, uh, we have divided the definition into uh, for to understand the intricacies involved. So basically, an SBO is an individual who would be a natural person. Now, he would be an Indian or a foreign resident as well. So he would be acting alone or together. Now, wherever uh, there are separate names for different natural persons who are acting together, may have a post pur purpose to control the target company. And these two or more persons, they shall be acting together and they would be treated as SBOs together. So these individuals through one or more persons or trust, which means direct or indirect relationship. Ma majorly, uh, the section uh, covers the indirect holdings via number of layers and complex layers. It in, uh, includes foreign person, foreign entity layers up till the uh, identification of the natural person. Now, these individuals possess uh, one or more of the following rights or entitlements in the reporting company. 
now uh, they would hold directly or indirectly more than 10% of the shares of the company now for, for the purpose of uh, uh, this section shares would uh, would mean equity shares including uh, con compulsory convertible preference shares compulsory convertible debentures and depository receipts now these section do not involve preference shares into the definition of shares and also wherever there are options to be considered options should be considered only when they get converted now these individuals holds uh, directly or indirectly uh, not less than 10% of the voting rights of the company now voting rights not to include preference shares as we discussed but uh, except when company when a company defaults in making payment of uh, for more than 2 years uh, the voting rights are also given to the preference shareholders, but they are considered for this definition until the subsistence of the default. Once the default is made good, uh, they, they are not counted uh, into calculation of this provision. Are JDR holders having any voting right which we may need to con con uh, count? Yes, sir. JDR holder? No. I don't think he has direct voting right. No, they are not having any voting right to participate until unless there is a request from the management. No, JDR holders have a voting right. Through their custodian, they exercise the voting right. JDR no. holders are holding the underlying shares through their custodian. Yes. Hmm. And the custodian is having the voting right. Probably through custodian, they exercise it. <laughs> Say, for example, in case of RIL, we have GDRs. The bank, the, the Bonnie Mellon, it is the, uh, what's called as you know, the holder which is holding the shares. It has the exercise, the, I mean, the voting rights, and it exercises its voting right through its authorized representative. It may be the custodian, it may be anyone else apart from that. Okay, sir. So these individuals also have right to participate or receive uh, in the, the distributable dividend more than 10%. Now, uh, for the calculation of total distributable dividend for purpose of this clause, even preference uh, dividends to preference shares is not counted. One these individuals like have... To, yeah. to put one thing I would like to inform the participants is that in case of listed companies, certain shares, uh, uh, we have to transfer it to the share suspense account with the stock exchanges. In such, that is, a, it is called I think a rule five or something like that. I don't remember exactly that rule. So in such case, what happened is the those shares which have been transferred to the share suspense account, the voting rights are frozen. Okay. Okay. So if I am not wrong, same is the case as far as the shares transferred to IEPF account also. There are no voting rights on that. In such case, when you are arriving at the voting rights of the company, the shares where you have the voting rights are frozen, we have to take that net voting rights. This voting right, 10% of the voting rights, if they are having it means what? Voting capital, we have to take it into account, not the total paid up capital of the company. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah. so nextly, uh, these individuals has uh, a right to exercise or actually exercises significant influence or control in any manner. Now, there are two alternatives to understand that uh, it involves actual exercise and contractual through any other person. So significant influence uh, for the purpose of SBO rules would mean the power of part participation into the decision-making policies. And this does not include control. Whereas uh, under uh, Section 2, as for the definitions of the Companies Act, it involves control of minimum 25% of voting or management control. So basically, wherever, if at all, uh, there is an individual influencing with or without shareholding, if there is evidence of influence, the person would be uh, the SBO. So coming to the definition of control, so control would mean right to appoint majority of the directors or control the management or policy decisions. And this may be by virtue of shareholding management rights or agreements thereto. Now there are two types of control to basically understand one is the voting control and the second one is management control. So basically wherever if natural person is in a position to manage uh, the control the management, 
the board of directors would deem to be the nominees of this person. Now coming to identification of SBOs when member is not an individual as per the SBO rules. So wherever the mem member is a company, the SBO shall be the individual who holds majority stake in that member who, uh, who, who would be holding majority of stake in the ultimate holding company of that particular company. If at all it is an HUF, the shareholder, uh, the SBO would be the karta of the HUF. If at all the member is a partnership firm, the individual would be uh, a partner, a partner having majority stake in that firm or a person uh, having majority stake in the ultimate holding company of that particular firm. There is a question has come. How to justify indirect control by the individual? How to justify? Indirect control by individual. He has to provide the declaration, sir. Then so how to justify indirect control of the, uh, the person concerned? You can see, you can refer to the Supreme Court case of Subratara and Sahara. When the two Sahara companies that point of time, Mr. Subhadra Sahara was neither a director of the company, nor he was a shareholder of the company, nor he was a promoter of the company. But ultimately, if you see, if you lift the corporate wheel, if you pierce the corporate wheel, the person who is behind that, it was Subhadra Sahara. So when you're talking about the control, maybe you have to sometimes lift the corporate wheel and identify the persons behind that. It is not that simple, I mean, that difficult to understand who is the person controlling it. Okay. Query to determine the significant beneficial owner. AVG Limited is a body corporate. Yeah, discussion. Sir, uh, uh, sir, one thing, one thing. See, yeah. I want to say to the participants that if you give your personal examples like this, A is this thing, B is this thing, C is this thing, like that, it is very, very difficult to identify who is the SBO. First of all, let us understand the concepts clearly instead of identifying who is the SBO. First of all, let Dupur make her presentation. If it is a company which is holding more than 10% in a company, if you want to, because the company cannot be a SBO, there are provisions are there. Same as the case if a HUF is your member or a partnership firm is your member, they are holding more than 10%, how the SBO is to be identified. Let us understand the provisions first, and then we will see that how to identify and all those things. Let us, I think, complete her uh, presentation to some extent, how to identify who are the people responsible and all those things. Yes, Nabur. Yeah, so uh, majority stake as defined is uh, that person holding 50% or more of the equity share capital or the voting rights or uh, receives any dividend uh, in that opus. So coming to where a person or the member is a trust. So basically uh, he would be an individual who would be a trustee in case of discretionary or a charitable trust. He would be a beneficiary in case of a specific trust or an author or settler in case of revocable trust. So in case where the uh, member is a pooled investment vehicle or any entity that is controlled by a pooled investment vehicle, which is a uh, participant of the member state of uh, FATF. So the individual would be a general partner, an investment manager, or wherever the investment manager would be a body corporate or partnership entity, it would be the CEO. So let's take up an example uh, for identification of the SBO. So basically, Mr. A holds 9% shares in A Limited. He's a registered owner. And B Limited holds 71% of A Limited. And ultimately, Mr. X holds 51% in B Limited. So though Mr. A is registered owner, he falls under the category of SBO as he indirectly holds, like uh, the uh, person asked about the question. So he holds indirectly into B limited 51%. This includes the majority stake as well. And apart from that, Mr. X is a direct SBO in B limited. Now the owners is uh, on both the companies as well to identify the uh, or obtain the declaration from Mr. X.
Now, understanding the difference between the two sections. Okay, so just for one minute, one minute. Dupur, yes, please sir. go back to the original slide. Let me explain that section 90. Yes, sir. Just go back. One more previous slide. Again, go back further. Again, yeah. See, as a company secretary, what we have to do? We have to identify that because it, the onus is on the company also to identify the significant beneficial owner. Your, uh, how, what is the resource for you to check and identify who is my SBO? It is your ROM because the company secretary is the, having the custody of the register of members with him. So it is the responsibility of the company secretary to identify the people who are holding more than 10% shares as per the ROM. If they are individuals, you don't need to worry. Because if they are all the any, suppose an individual is holding say 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever the percentage it is, if it is in the individual name directly, there is no opaqueness, so you don't need to worry. You don't need to declare an SBO. But say, for example, a company is A Limited is holding, say, 10% shareholding. So that A company's responsibility is to make a declaration that so-and-so person is the SBO. If that company is not coming voluntarily and if they are not filing that Ben 1, it is the responsibility of the, the security company to give a show cause notice under Ben 4 to that particular company. Now, how to identify who is the SBO? The individual who is holding the majority stake in that company or the holding majority stake in the ultimate holding company. So, either of the one, say for example, the company which is holding the shares is, suppose A Limited. A Limited is the security company and B Limited is the shareholder who is holding 10% shares. So the individual who is holding majority shareholding in B Limited or its ultimate holding company, if at all anything is there, if it is not there, you can't find up to B Limited only. It may so happen that person is not having majority stake in the B Limited, but he is having majority stake in the ultimate holding company that is Z Limited. Even then he will become the SBO. Now, what is majority holding? It is defined already. Majority holding means more than 50% shareholding in that company. But please remember that when they say majority stake in their company, they are not said directly or indirectly. So you have to say only directly. Indirect holding, you don't need to cover because they have not used the word indirectly in the wild definition of the majority stake is concerned. Second, now this is as far as the company is concerned. Now, the HUF is holding the shares more than 10%. Obviously, HUF anyway, he has to hold it through Karta only. So, Karta will become the SBO and they have to give the declaration. Because in the register of members, a HUF's shares are registered in the name of Karta only. Since Karta is the SBO, it is the responsibility of the HUF to declare it. Otherwise, the company has to get the declaration. Simple. Come to the partnership form. If a partnership firm is a member of your company, it may be through one partner or maybe all partners. But in case of a partnership firm, what happens is all the partners become SBOs, not only single partner. Number one. Similarly, suppose there are three partners are there and three partners have having different ratios of profit sharing. They will not become the SBOs in that proportion of partnership sharing but they will become the SBO for all the shares, whatever that partnership form is having in that particular company. So while you are filing the declaration, they have to say that, say for example, um, uh, the suppose Tiripal and Sudhakar are the partners in the partnership form, and they are holding, say for example, 10%, that is 1 lakh shares. If we cannot say 50,000 shares Tiripal is SBO and 50,000 shares Sudhakar is SBO, no. For entire 1 lakh shares, Sudhakar is also SBO and Tiripal is also the SBO. This is how it is to be identified. Now come to the trust. Next slide, go please. Trust. So in case of a trust, you have three trusts are there. Char that is a charitable trust, sorry, that discretionary trust or a specific trust and then irrevocable trust. If it is a discretionary trust, it is the trustee who will be the SBO. 
So in case of a trust is having the shares, you have to first of all see that what type of a trust it is. If it is a specific trust, the beneficiary will become the SBO. And if it is a irrevocable trust, the person who has settled the trust, he will become the SBO. But in case of a charitable, why that in case of a discretionary trust, the trustee is the SBO because in case of a discretionary trust, the discretion is rests with the trustee who will become the beneficiary because it is his discretion. That's why the beneficiary is not becoming the SBO, but it is the trustee who is becoming the SBO there. And in case of a irrevocable trust, it is the settler who is having that power because he settled the trust and it is an irrevocable trust. That's why settler is the SBO. And in case of a beneficiary trust, it is beneficiaries are already identified. So they're the, not the trustee, but the beneficiaries are becoming the SBOs. I hope I could explain what exactly how the SBOs are to be identified and who will be the SBO. Go ahead, Nupur. Yes, So coming to the uh, differences between the two sections. So basically, section 89 is applicable when a person require, acquires beneficial interest, irrespective of whatever the uh, percentile he is holding. And section 90 is applicable when the beneficial interest in concern is more than 10%. So intent of the two sections is to take cognizance of registered owner. Wherever the registered owner and beneficial owner are two different persons, in section 89 and under section 90, it is uh, uh, primary to reveal the natural person behind. So identification of natural person is not limited to section 89. The thresh there is no threshold under section 89, wherever there are two different persons uh, for uh, ownership as in registered or uh, beneficial owner, the, there is to be made a declaration. And as per section 90, the beneficial interest acquired should be more than 10%. Section 89 includes preferences, section 90 do not include preferences. And the onus is specifically under section 90 on the company as well to call for the information from the uh, wherever it feels uh, there is any beneficial owner uh, as well. So coming to the provisions of section 90. So basically an SBO has to make declaration to the company specifying the interest that he holds. So that is to be done in Ben form one uh, within 30 days of acquisition of such beneficial interest or any change thereon. After receiving this declaration from the SBO, the reporting company has to file Ben form two within 30 days of receipt of such declaration with the registrar. It has to maintain, uh, the company has to maintain register of uh, interest uh, of SBOs in form Ben 3 and it is open to is inspection by members on payment of certain fees. Just go back uh, one minute, uh, before go back to the previous slide. See here in the first column, second bullet, form Ben 1 within 30 days of acquisition of such significant beneficial ownership or any change thereon. Yes. Unfortunately, if you see in the rules, what is a change? They are not defined. Okay. Whether it is one share, also it is a change. Yes. Or maybe one lakh shares, also it is a change. In fact, when we met the MCA at that point of time, we did brought this to the notice of the ministry that change is also to be defined. In fact, that point of time, I still remember the JS asked me this question. According to you, what should be the change? I said that the moment the person filed the SBO and he has declared himself the individual concerned, when I'm holding say 10% or plus, say for example, I am having 25% shareholding. It is immaterial, it becomes 35 or it becomes 15 because I'm continuing to be a significant beneficial owner. So I said that the change should be if it is touching 10% or if it is going below 10%. Suppose say for example, I'm ceasing to be a sig significant mm -hmm. beneficial owner because today I'm holding 10%, tomorrow I'm going to hold say 9.9%. .9%. I am not a significant beneficial owner. That time the change is to be filed. Otherwise, what is the objective? Suppose, but only thing, but unfortunately what happens here is it is not there. So even a single share change, technically calling it, 
it may amounts to a change in the shareholding of the SBO. And if you ask whether Ben one is to be filed for every such change, answer is yes. Yeah, as the matter stands today, it has to be filed. Yes, sir. Because, because right. As you rightly said, any change, yeah, it has to correct. be filed. Yeah. So it is also the obligation of companies to call for uh, such information wherever it feels like there is some uh, significant beneficial ownership uh, as well. So the company, wherever it feels uh, a person to have knowledge of, uh, firstly, it would be uh, an SBO of the company. Secondly, the person would, uh, any person who might having knowledge of the identity of the SBO or any other person which would likely to have such knowledge, or he might be any person uh, has been the CE, uh, SBO at any time during the three preceding financial years before the notice was passed. Yeah. No, put some more fingers gone. What if the individual in partnership firm is not holding more than 10%? Sir, individual is the partnership firm, what he is holding is immaterial. I said if the partnership firm is holding more than 10% in the company, all the partners will become the significant beneficial owners. You are absolutely right. The moment the individual comes into the picture, SBO is out of it. Correct. Yes. The moment any body corporate comes into picture, then the SBO is actually comes into the picture. So as far as this question is concerned, the individual is there, it is immaterial. It, it doesn't come at all. Two corporate members in the private company, then any intimation to MCA, that natural person being an ultimate holding company. What is the what is the question? I couldn't understand this. Two corporate members in a private company. In a private company, there are two corporate members of the members. The question See, is any intimation to be given, that natural uh, person is ultimate holding company. I will I will answer this question. Tripal, if you want, then should I take it? No, please, sir. Please, you can take okay. it. Say, for example, there is, there is a private company. There are two uh, members are there, A Limited and B Limited. Suppose A Limited is holding 50%, B Limited is holding 50%. So, both are uh, companies holding more than 10%. So, now it is the responsibility of those companies to identify who is the individual holding majority stake in those companies. Suppose A Limited, it has to identify who is the person holding more than 50% shareholding in A Limited. Similarly, B Limited has to identify who is the individual holding more than 50% in it. For any reason, in both these companies, no individual is holding more than 50%. Both the companies have to make a declaration to the company that there are no significant beneficial owners as far as they are concerned. Period. But suppose in case of Yale Limited, Tiripal is holding 51% shareholding. In case of B Limited, there is nobody holding more than 50%. So B Limited says that there is no SBO as far as my company is concerned. A Limited is concerned, it will say Mr. Tiripal is my SBO and it has to file the Ben 1 with the company. Yeah. Is Ben form is mandatory for the private company as well? Yes, 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 Section yeah, 90 is applicable to private answer, company also. Answer is See, yes, possibly in fact, yes. Mala, sir, let me, let me say to the participants one thing. I always say, most of the forums I said this, I am repeating it again. In Companies Act 2013, as on date, there are three five brand sections. If I am the regulator, if I come for inspection or investigation, I will talk to, I will take that person to task only on three or four sections. And three major sections are, one is section 188, related party transactions. The understanding of this is still not there with, with all due regards to the fraternity. Section, then second section is section 90. And third section is section 135. This is emerging as a fire brand section. Non-compliances will be viewed very seriously by the regulator. Section 90 is concerned. And unfortunately or fortunately, all these three sections are applicable to private limited companies also. 135 is applicable, 90 is applicable, 188 is applicable. So private limited company, company secretaries cannot relax that I am working for a private limited company. In the, I think last week only I was addressing one forum there. I said that if you are a private limited company, company secretary, earlier you were to feel shy that most of the, the provisions are not applicable to me. 
now most of the provisions are applicable to you and especially these three things so be proud to be a company secretary even of a private limited company <laughs> if a private limited company is incorporated as 100% subsidiary company of a private limited company wherein two nominee shareholders are there from incorporation what compliances to be complied with I think two no, nominee no, shareholders cannot be there. Only one nominee can be there. 89 should be complied. Okay. Because 90 also will come. 90 Sir, also will come. Yeah, 89 and 90 both will come. Both should come. Sir, SBO's purpose is only to ultimately identify who are the individual at the end. That's the only purpose. If both the, uh, in one company, two body corporate are holding, then um, can we not go beyond even two companies in which how the shareholding is there? Because of uh, individual are there or not, ultimately any artificial person, there will be some individual. So we have to reach and do the <coughs> kind of uh, compliance or not to determine the 10% who holds. Hey, let me clarify one thing. Yeah. A company not necessarily SBO is to be there. Correct. A company may not have a significant beneficial owner also. Even if you go upper and upper, upper and upper in the hierarchy, because ultimately the person, the individual concerned has to have the majority holding, then only he will become SBO. So there may be companies, the individuals are there, but no individual is holding more than 50%. So they are not SBOs. So it is not mandatory. In fact, let me also say that few of the forums, people used to say that, sir, how to protect my promoter from becoming an SBO? I said, what the nonsense here? Why you have to protect your promoter? By declaring he is an SBO, he is not committing a crime or he is not putting his head into the nose. He is only saying that oh, I, I am the person who is ultimately controlling this company. I am the person who is the karta dharta of this group, whatever you may call it as. Because why it is purpose is that the web of companies are holding the controlling interest and ultimately if the regulator wants to catch hold of the person tomorrow, it was not uh, coming to know that the round tripping of, as uh, Balasar has mentioned, the money laundering is taking place through the corporate structures. Purpose of SBO is nothing but to identify ultimately who is the individual concerned. By merely with section 90, you will be able to put your hand. Maybe, may not be. Okay, people are very wise. The moment you put a checkmate, they will know how to break that also. Okay, so not necessarily, but at the same point of time, you have to have a framework to identify the culprits. This section 90 and the rules thereof is towards that only. I it's think the there's one more thing which is there, which we said we'll okay. discuss later. Okay. Sir, yeah. You are absolutely right and true the statement what you have given. At the time of introducing this and in preliminary compliances, it was difficult to convince to the promoter. Then to convince to them that this is in the disclosure is in your own interest. Correct. In letter and spirit, because we say, no, I'm the promoter, so why I should hold? Why I should disclose? That's the one question. So for a company secretary, convincing to the promoters by quoting the reference of only uh, act, we go beyond that and we convince to them that this is in the interest of the promoter only. This is that, that in future tomorrow, this disclosure will help in any investigation. So you are right, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. ABC Limited is a body corporate. A discretionary trust holds 100% shareholding in ABC Limited, which is registered in the name of PQR Limited, a professional trust as a said discretionary trust. ABC holds 15% shares in XY Z Limited, a body corporate. In light of the above fact, who is the SPO for XY Limited? See, this is what I told you know, these are all hypothetical questions. If you understand the concepts, it is very easy to uh, I mean, give it. Because in a forums like this, if you give either one, it may lead to a wrong this thing. I never answer these type of questions in forums like this, whether it is a personal, I mean, you know, that in a physical forum 
or virtual forum because it is not that simple to identify the significant beneficial owner several times sir i have found that the person who is putting the query he himself is not having the proper facts when you put the counter questions he has to scratch he started scratching his head he will say sir i will get back to you on this information or he might not even be placing the query properly with all the facts and figures similarly if i am not able to understand that properly if i say x y z or abc or whoever it is it may lead to a wrong answer you are absolutely so, right unless you have the full facts you cannot answer that correct. right that, that's why in this type of forums we should neither ask these type of queries nor we should answer these type of queries with all due regards my uh, i mean i regret to inform you that i cannot answer this kind of questions sorry yeah move forward nupur yeah sir so whenever a company calls for a show cause uh, for the persons to believe to be uh, knowing the sbo the such concerned person shall revert to the company with such information within 30 days time so a company can make application to tribunal as well within a period of 15 days of after the expiry of the period specified under the notice so it can apply uh, so wherever a company fails to give the information to the company or wherever the company feels like the information provided by the person is not satisfactory it may apply to the tribunal to pass an order uh, directing the uh, restrictions to be imposed on the transfer of the interest uh, of the shares in matter or suspension of all the rights attached towards the shares and any such other matters as well so the tribunal may revert after giving an opportunity of being heard to the concerned parties and it may order uh, restricting the rights attached there to any person who is aggrieved with the order of the tribunal it can file an application to the tribunal for relaxation or lifting the restrictions as well now the sbo rules provides exemption uh, to certain companies so as far as the uh, to to the extent the shares are uh, held by the reporting company uh, it would be an uh, iepf authority or its holding reporting company it would be a central government or state government or any other local authority if it is a reporting company or a body corporate or entity that is controlled by the central or the state government or partially by the central or the state government those are exempt one more no, thing has, the... one more thing has come as per the format of bank declaration distinctive number number of the share etc have to be specified what detail shall be mentioned therein since the ultimate owner does not hold any share directly in the company so where the registered owner holds the shares that description has to be entered sir as to which distinctive number shares he is holding mm. for the beneficial owner okay yeah go ahead yeah so other exemptions uh, are to the sebi registered investment vehicles like mutual funds or eif or reits including infrastructure investment trusts which are regulated by the uh, by the sebi also investment vehicles which are regulated by rbi or irdi and pension fund regulatory and development authority as well so coming to the penal provisions wherever section 90 is not followed there are tremendous amount of penalties that has been levied so uh, wherever a person uh, which is a significant beneficial owner he fails to provide declaration under section 90 sub section 1 he would be uh, liable for a penalty of 50000 rupees and for every continuing default he shall be liable for rupees 1000 for every day uh, during which the default continues wherever a company fails to maintain a register under section 90 sub section 2 or it fails to provide uh, information to uh, under section 90 sub section 4 and wherever the company uh, denies for the inspection of the register every company and officer in default shall be liable to a fine a company shall be liable to a fine up to rupees 1 lakh and for every continuing default 500 rupees for every first uh, after every first day which will be uh, subject to maximum of 5 lakh rupees 
every officer in default is also liable to pay a penalty of rupees 25000 rupees and rupees 200 for every day during which the default continues that means basically there are three compliances comes into yes one is filing non filing the form in time second yes. thing is there maintaining the records and register yes because this is as, as good as a statutory register only it is not only maintaining a register maintaining the up to date entry register that is yes, required sir, yes sir even otherwise that will also amount to the non compliances and the third thing is again denying the any inspection yes. and yesterday we were discussing with sudhagar and tripal and that time yes. it came to sudhagar pointed out Although you are not filed the form, your penalty is actually lesser. But if you look at non-maintaining of the records and not having the inspection, that penalty itself is higher than what is the non-filing the form. Because here we can see this is fifty thousand rupees here as again this is one lakh rupees, and here again it is up to two lakh rupees where it is up to five lakh rupees. Similarly, for the officers also the fines are actually higher twenty five thousand and one lakh rupees. So it shows very clearly the role and responsibility of the company secretary, as far as the section 90 is concerned, which is really, yes, really sir. a very vibrant section. It is not only we can close our eyes; we have to actually find out. We have to regularly monitor our list of members and find out who's are holding more than 10 percent and inquire what is the beneficial ownership, get the satisfactory answer, doing the needful maintain the record. It shows. Trabant is responsible the company secretaries, we should take care of it. That is what I would say. Yeah. I will just add one, one line with the permission of the panelists is, especially when we are doing exports and import, where the ultimate beneficial owner is a sanctioned person, then we have to be very, very, very careful. And this is also very important as a, a company secretary. And so this also is very critical. In fact, earlier I used to say that normally several companies used to have third party audits for related party transactions, but no such third party audits were there for section 90. According to me, that is very, very much required and especially in case of secretarial audit also, it is the responsibility of the secretarial auditor to give proper attention to section 90 when he is signing the secretarial audit report whether the company has properly complied with Section 90 provisions or not. Yes, Lupur, go ahead. Okay, sir. So, uh, wherever a person provides false or incorrect information or suppresses any material information also, he would be liable to action under Section 447, uh, which is fraud. And wherever the amount in fraud in, uh, involved is less than rupees 10 lakh or 1% uh, of the turnover of the company, whichever is lower, there is also the imprisonment uh, given under the penalty, uh, which would be from 6 months to 10 years and fine not less than the amount which is involved in fraud, which may extend to 3 times of the amount. So wherever the amount is more than 10 lakh rupees or 1% of the turnover of the company, whichever is lower, the imprisonment may be up to five years and the fine may be up to rupees 25 lakh rupees as well. So we'll take up a case law to just uh, see how big the penalty matter is, as in uh, the penalties that are actually imposed per day by the ROCs as well. So this was the case of uh, Contlo Technologies Private Limited based in uh, Bangalore. So the adjudicating order was passed by ROC Bangalore. So in case of this company, Bento was filed uh, very late as in after 30, 163 days. Uh, and the penalties imposed were on the company, it was 1 lakh rupees plus 500 rupees for every day. That was for 163 days, which was amounted to 1 lakh 81,500 rupees. Each director was also levied a penalty of rupees 25,000 plus 500 rupees for each day that amounted to 75,600 each. So total penalty of 2 lakh rupees, 2 lakh 96,700 rupees was levied by the ROCs as well. 
so we as a company secretary must take, must take note of such penalties as well and protect the uh, promoters as well somebody asked whether the bentu is applicable to the private limited company you can see the case this is a private yes, limited sir. company case yes yeah. sir. i think one person lifted hand yes 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 tanmay you want to have some queries go ahead Uh, so my query is uh, hello. Am I audible? Yeah, very yes, much. Yes, uh, sir. So my query is uh, the currently the buyback is going on, and due to buyback, uh, the extinguishment of shares is going. So uh, there is any uh, means uh, there is change in share holding of a significant beneficial ownership uh, of one FBO in our case. So do we need to file bin two in on each extinguishment? Very much, very much. You need to. Okay. Okay. Yes, Kapoor. Yes, sir. We completed the presentation. Okay. Uh, that, we can take uh, up any questions as well. Uh, sir, have... what I will do is before you take up the question answers. Yeah. Uh, let me give the salient features of uh, this SBO section ninety. Normally, I used to give it at the end of my presentation, which sure, I would sure. like to do here yeah, also. Sure, sure. Go ahead. So, number one. A report, a reporting company. What is? If you see the rules, they are quite frequently used in the word reporting company. Similarly, if the reporting company is its holding company, then Section ninety is exempted to the company. So, reporting company means a company which is incorporated under the Companies Act. That is defined in the rules. Second, a reporting company may have more than one significant beneficial owner. Not necessarily a company has to have. only one significant beneficial owner there may be more how many more it all depends there may be n number of people similarly a reporting company may not have even a single significant beneficial owner it is not mandatory for a company to have an sbo if it is not there he is not there that's it and as we know that section 90 starts with a an individual so it is should be a natural person only who can be a sbo if an individual has not only direct holding and then or if he is holding a beneficial holding and he has filed the declaration then he will not become a significant beneficial owner say for example i am holding in a company say 25% of its holding or i am a registered owner and holding 25% of a company's shares but i have filed the declaration under section 89 then i will not become the significant beneficial owner even if through a company also but suppose the company in which i am having the majority stake as a beneficial holder say for example a miner is holding say 51% in a company and miner cannot hold it so i am the guardian and i have filed that declaration under section 89 so even if i am a majority stake i am holding it in that body corporate which is owning 10% in the reporting company still i will not become spo but if i am not filing the declaration under section 89 i will become the spo for spo declaration indirect holding along with direct holding is mandatory that means if i am holding say even 50 60 70% directly i don't need i will not become an sbo because what is the purpose of the sbo is to remove the opaqueness to identify the individual behind since as an individual i am a registered holder i will not become the sbo but together with my direct holding that means say for example more than 10% whatever the percentage it is even if a single share i am holding indirectly then i have to give the declaration as a significant beneficial owner sbo rules have prescribed different parameters for assessing the indirect holding through body corporates through partnership forms through trust through huf and all those things that is to be considered properly as i have mentioned earlier llp is not a body corporate for the purpose of these rules for all other purposes llp is a body corporate under the companies act but not for the sbo rules significant control is defined under the rules which is different to that of the definition under the companies act 
definition of control is defined under section 2 as per section subsection 27 of the act that is the same definition this thing is there onus of sbo declaration lies on the significant beneficial owner onus of obtaining such declaration lies on the reporting company so it is the, the responsibility is there both on them so if even if the significant beneficial owner is not filing the ben 1 it is the responsibility of the company to arrive at as per the its rom wherever it suspects a person is an sbo you have to give a show cause notice to him under ben 4 that as per my rom it seems that you are the significant beneficial owner you are not given declaration in ben 1 kindly ensure that before the time expires reporting company to take necessary steps to identify the SBO and to obtain the declaration. Provisions of section 89 portents to declaration of beneficial interest and provisions of section 90 portents to declaration of significant beneficial ownership. So these are two separate sections and so two separate compliances are there. I have not complied with 89 so I will not be able to comply with section 90 or vice versa is not the case. By making the declaration of SBO, the opaqueness is being removed. The ambiguity in case of change in SBO is continuing. This is what I have mentioned. Change in SBO means what exactly? That is still there, that is not removed. So technically speaking, even a single share changing, either selling or buying, it amounts to change in the shareholding as far as the SBO is concerned. And he may have to file that Ben 1 form with the company and in turn the company has to file Ben 2 form. This is the summary and substance of uh, section 90. Thank you. Uh, the question has come here. What about the mutual funds? For this, there is already a participant answered. Holding by SEBI registered mutual fund, it is exempted under section 90 rule 80. Correct. Then there is one more question has come. If A holds 90% in the X limited, and B holds 80% share in A limited, and C holds 80% in B limited, and Mr. XYZ holds 51% in C limited. If B limited is a reporting company, who is the ultimate holding company of B limited? So the natural person uh, ultimately holding would be the SBO. Yeah, here you have to do the homework actually, because just yes. talking this company, this company doesn't matter. As to the exactly. Answer is actually explained very clearly. You know, to go and ask who is the natural person behind holding the control interest. And as he rightly says, not necessarily one person will be there. There may be more persons also. Yes. But doing yes. the thorough inquiry and getting the details, then only it can be determined. Just offered by looking at it, we cannot answer. Uh, maybe, sir, we can uh, maybe analyze this fact here. Yeah. See the Mr. Who is that guy holding? A holds 90% in X. A is the individual. No, A limited. A limited. Here a the individual is, is XYZ. No, no, no. XYZ is an individual. Yeah. He is holding shares in the C, 51%. Hmm. So C is not a reporting company, first yeah. of all. Yeah. Then if you go to the next, C holds the shares in the 80% in the B company. Hmm. So B is the first reporting company. Okay, the XYZ is supposed to give the declaration to the Ben 1 to the B saying that through C, I am holding the shares in your company. Through C, I am controlling the shares in the B company. Hmm. Now, B is the first level reporting company. Since B has the subsidiary called A, I think. So now for B, it is called reporting holding company. So reporting holding company, B will be considered as a reporting holding company. Whatever the reporting holding company uh, co already complied in filing the Ben 1 for the holding by XYZ. Now XYZ need not give declaration to the A. He doesn't need to give the declaration to the A. The B has to give the declaration what he has filed by collecting the XYZ information that should be passed on to him. Passed on, then whatever the Ben 2 filed by the B should be passed on to the A. A will file a dummy Ben 2, taking that into consideration. Means A is a subsidiary company. Now, if the chain of link is like that, so first level 
Reporting holding company will do the Ben 1 and Ben 2. Ben 1 will be given by the individual shareholder. Ben 2 filed by them based on that. Then next level subsidiaries will file Ben 2, but they, the ultimate owner need not give the reporting uh, like a subsidiary purpose. He need not give the Ben 1. So that sir can correct it. I don't apply my mind on this form. I told you very clearly, Tirpal. Yes, sir. Because, sir. see, what happens is, in between the company, if it is a reporting company, and it is a holding company, then the Section 90 is not applicable at all. So, there are various parameters are to be said. You have to sit on the drawing board. You have to say what is the relationship on all these companies. So, these kind of chain relationships, I cannot understand on forum like this. Because that will lead to a wrong answer and tomorrow somebody will quote you and your image is gone. Correct. You are right. <laughs> In case of the foreign company of 100% subsidiary Indian company, whether need to find SBO under report? Sure, yes. Fine. It has to. It has to be. Yes. See, if if the reporting, it, it is a, say, section 90 is applicable to the reporting company. As far as the compliances are concerned, Section 90 means a company which is incorporated under the Companies right. Act. As far as the significant beneficial you owner know. is concerned, there they have used the word body corporate. So even if that that part, the shareholder, even if it is a body corporate holding more than 10% shares, then you have to identify who is the person holding majority stake in that body corporate and then again you have to go ahead. So there a foreign company is also you have to see if a foreign company is holding say more than 10% stake in your company, you have to identify who is the individual concerned holding it. I think that is all the questions I have on the chat box. With that, uh, I have come to end. That means still your hand is risen. You have still anything? I can see your hand. Any other questions of the participants have? We will be definitely willing to take. I don't see anything. So, with sir, your permission, we, can we? Yeah, one thing, I think, one minute. Sir, sir Mara, sir, when you are complying uh, this uh, uh, reporting requirement, uh, we are also required to comply takeover code, insider trading code, and all. So, whenever you report to the company about your uh, as a, being an SBO, you are required to also file to the stock exchanges? Yes or no? I think as per SBO rule, as per SEBI rule, we are supposed to disclose their answer. They have, they have also mentioned the SBO rule. Yeah, SBO is uh, there in LODR also. LODR also, similar LODR rule also is it is there, similar. So you know to report if it is a listed company. They are given time frame, their own time frame, like yeah. two working days, three working days. So when we are doing the uh, compliance under takeover code and insider uh, trading code, in addition to that, when you are reporting this one also, then you copy to a uh, stock exchange is also required. Simultaneously. So it is a independent compliance also while filing to the company. We need to file to the stock exchange also. Is it correct? It is an independent compliance, the way you are doing under takeover code, the way do, you are doing under insider trading code, yeah. you have to do under SBO also as per the, uh, the same so requirements. Yeah. If it is, it is getting triggered. But as far as section 90 is concerned, these compliances are different. Hmm. Section 90 compliances does not automatically ask you to do the what's called as a market copy of the, to the stock exchanges. It is not so. Hmm. Is there any need to calculate proportional holding in any case where there is indirect holding while identifying the SBO? No. Answer is no. Can ultimate beneficial owner can ask to deposit dividend directly in his account from reporting company? He cannot directly ask, but the registered owner may direct yeah. the company Register, or register, ask the company. Yeah, to correct. Yeah. Everything has to come from the registered owner only. Registered owner only can direct. That is the answer. Yeah. See, as far as the company is concerned, it is only the registered owner. Correct. So what is not talk to any Tom, Dick, and Harry. Even correct, if the correct. beneficial interest is also there, that is only for the purpose of declaration. But beneficial owner has nothing to do with the company <coughs> and vice versa. Correct. You are right. What is the purpose of filing Bent 2 for declaration of holding reporting company? 
So basically, ben, after filing Ben2, there is also a unique code given by MCA for the beneficial owner as well. So they are also maintaining a database as well, we can say. Not only that, ROC should know that when Ben2 is filed by the subsidiary company, yes. why there is no SBO? Mm. Because the SBO mm. rules are not applicable to it because it is a subsidiary of a reporting company and it is exempted. That is the purpose. Right. So in fact, in fact, let me also further say that a question has come up. When you are filing Ben2, you have to attach the Ben1. And in yes, this yes. case, there is no Ben1 because it is an exempted company. So what you have to do is you have to attach a letter. Okay. So that's what we did exactly. We attached a letter stating that the uh, reporting company is a subsidiary of uh, the holding company, which itself is a reporting company. In view of this, uh, the filing of Ben1 is not required. That is to the extent of the holding by the reporting holding company. Correct. Suppose it is not 100% subsidiary, balance 49, if there is any then obviously, money corporate, yeah. you should make this. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. That is, that is right. Absolutely right. I would like to add up that the database is also a very significant uh, uh, of very significant importance. As you know, uh, MCA also uh, back then in 2017 or so, they also constituted task force for shell companies. So they were my, uh, monitoring all the malpractices of the shell companies as well. So around in 2017, even SEBI, all, uh, sorry, SBI, uh, CBI as well registered 30 cases against the uh, shell companies back then. So even it is important uh, as in for the income tax departments to detect the shell companies. Yeah. I think that's all the questions which are there in the chat box. I think that brings to the end of our session. Uh, I must uh, express my sincere <laughs> thanks to Trupal and uh, Sudhagar answering the various yes, clarification sir. and questions which has been raised. Really, the session was very, very interactive. Personally, I have benefited to getting know many things actually from these two expert uh, panelists. And uh, I must also appreciate Nupur for her nice uh, presentation and also elucidating in a very flow English, understandable way by everybody. I must appreciate sir. She has done an excellent homework, put everything in together, especially analyzing difference between the section 89, section 90 in the very capsule form, etc. I must thank you, Nupur. Thanks a lot. With Thank this, so we much, close sir. the session. Thanks. We meet in some other session in the forthcoming week. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. Session comes to an end. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.